You're listening to the Hayek Program Podcast. This podcast includes audio from lectures, interviews, and discussions from scholars and visitors of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. To learn more about the Hayek Program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. To learn about graduate student fellowship opportunities with the Mercatus Center at George Mason University for students at Mason as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. We're here today on uh, April 30th, 2021, uh, to discuss this great book by uh, Virgil Store and Ginny Choi, Do Markets Corrupt Our Morals? Um, I have a great uh, guests here with us to have this conversation with us. Uh, we have Brianna Wolf, who is a professor of political theory at the James Madison College at Michigan State, and she's an expert on the Scottish and, Scottish and French Enlightenments um, and liberalism and moral judgment, and so we're really happy to have Brie with us to uh, add to this conversation. We have uh, Rosemary Freich, um, who is a professor at Texas Christian University, and she's one of the uh, real serious economists addressing the question in measurement about the lives and status of women and how alternative institutions impact that. Um, she's uh, won the Additing Prize for Measurement in Social Science just in 2017, and so she has great work in that, and so she again brings a, 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 an important perspective to this. And finally, we have uh, Chad Vandesloot. I don't know if I said your name right. I, I get it wrong all the time. Chad uh, is a professor at Tulane University's Department of, of Philosophy. Um, he's an expert in PPE, uh, focusing on public reason and social uh, contract traditions in political economy and political philosophy. Um, and uh, we have representing the authors today, uh, my colleague, uh, Ginny Choi. Uh, Ginny is an experimental economist, um, but also a political economist. Uh, we were able to uh, bid her away from the snares of, of the nice life of tenured academic life and bring her back to George Mason where she works with us as uh, in our academic and student programs, uh, which we are uh, continually developing, even in the wake of the COVID pandemic. Uh, we've continued to find a way to continue to do our activities. And Jenny is a major reason for us ability to have success in doing that. And she's the author of, with, of on her own and with Virgil of many different papers in experimental economics and political economy. And this book is their joint effort examining these questions. I've been teaching from this book for the entire year um, and during the pandemic because I taught an economic sociology class where it's a required reading. And now I'm teaching my uh, comparative institutions graduate class in which it's a required reading. All the master's students have to write a review essay actually of the book in it. And the reason why I particularly chose this book is because I think it's a scholarly masterpiece of how to craft an argument with kindness. Um, they give the opponents of the market the best hearing, I think, that you can get from a more or less market-oriented person to allow those uh, voices to be heard and to show great empathy with the criticisms that are being raised, but then to actually examine what uh, you know are, is the record on whether or not the kind of criticisms and the way we see solutions to those criticisms actually address those criticisms or exacerbate the very problems that we're trying to, to help. And I think it's a masterpiece of economic reasoning applied to a very important uh, aspect of our life, which is moral reasoning. So the way this will go is uh, Jenny will have uh, 20 minutes to present her uh, the work uh, from the book. And then we will go in the order of uh, Brie, Rosemary, and then, and then uh, Chad. Um, and then Ginny will have a chance to initiate a dialogue between all of us, and then we'll wrap up. So I wanna thank everyone again for being here and let's get started. So the floor is yours, Dr. Choi. Um, thank you so much, Pete, for that uh, really, really kind um, introduction. Um, before I get started, uh, Virgil and I uh, would like to thank our colleagues in the 
hype program and academic and student programs, especially Stephanie Malia Matt uh, for making this book panel happen. And more importantly, we would like to thank the um, panelists, um, Bree, Rosie, and Chad. We're truly honored that they agreed to be a part of the discussion today and that they took um, the time to carefully read our book. I'm really excited to hear their thoughts on our books later on and for um, our discussion. Um, I've been asked to do an overview of our book um, titled Do Markets Corrupt Our Morals? And what I thought I would do is illustrate our main proposition uh, with the tale of two Koreas. So in 1945, um, the Korean Peninsula was liberated from the oppressive rule of the Japanese empire uh, with the victory of the allied forces in World War II. The United States and the Soviet Union at the time um, agreed to jointly supervise the surrender of the Japanese forces and divided the peninsula into two zones along the 38th um, parallel line. However, the Soviets and the Americans didn't agree on how various things will play out, and later the Soviets refused to partake in the first Korean democratic election. So as a result, only the government in what is now South Korea was recognized as um, the sole legitimate government on the peninsula in 1948. And along with the rising tensions between the Soviet Union and the United States, um, the armistice agreement at the end of the Korean War left the peninsula separated by the 38th parallel um, in 1953. Under the Soviet influence, North Korea became a communist country with a centrally planned economy, which later developed into a dictatorship with a cult of personality surrounding the Kim family. Under the American influence, over time, South Korea developed into a democratic uh, market economy that employs um, free enterprise policies and with a vibrant civil society. Um, let me pause here for a second and uh, stress something. So at the time of separation, um, the two Koreas were really identical on all relevant margins, um, culturally, socially, historically, politically, economically, and um, also ethnically. Leading up to that point, both Koreas experienced the same successes, the same traumas, and the same oppressions. And furthermore, for uh, much of its history, Korea had a monarchy with a confused uh, bureaucracy and a social, um, a social system that was in a lot of ways similar to, but less strict than the Indian caste system. So when, uh, when the two Koreas separated, they were also both introduced to exogenous institutions. Again, North Korea to communism and um, centrally planned economy and South Korea to democracy and the market economy. Now let's fast forward 70 years. The two Koreas today cannot be any more different. According to various data statistics from the 2010s that we looked at uh, from the World Bank, IMF, the CIA, and, um, and more, South Korea consistently ranked among the top 15 to um, top 20 richest countries in the world, while North Korea was consistently listed as one of the poorest countries in the world. And during that time period, the GDP per capita in South Korea was about 20 times larger than that of um, North Korea. And the unemployment rate in South Korea was in the low single digits while the unemployment rate in North Korea, according to some estimates was around 25%. Um, South Korea's Gini coefficient um, remained within the 0.3 range throughout the um, 2010s. And while there's no official Gini coefficient, at least that we know of, for North Korea, some estimates that were generated using um, survey responses from North Korean defectors suggest, suggest that their Gini coefficient might have fallen between 0.63 and 0.86. And if that is true, um, this Gini coefficient would rank North Korea as a country with one of the worst, if not the worst income inequality in the world. The same statistics also show that South Koreans live longer than North Koreans by about a decade. 
uh, the mortality rate of children under five years old in North Korea was consistently about five times larger than that of South Korea. And in 2016, the maternal mortality uh, ratio in North Korea was about nine times larger than that of South Korea. And a study found that North Korean men were on average three to eight centimeters shorter than South Korean men, or about 1.2 to 3.2 inches. And in fact, there's like this uh, photo on the internet of an American, a North Korean, a South Korean um, soldier at the DMZ line. And granted, the photo is like not straight on, it's kind of taken at a um, slight angle and all. But in that photo, the South Korean and the American soldiers were about the same height, and the North Korean soldier barely reached their shoulders, and he has his um, army hat on. So given that in North Korea, the military is given preferential treatment and North Korean soldiers are rationed more food than the other citizens, that photo, at least to me and Virgil, were, was really telling about the state of affairs um, in North Korea. And I could go on uh, with the statistics, but for the interest of time, let me now focus on North Korea. It is probably not surprising to hear that North Korea does not have political nor civil um, rights, nor do they really have economic freedom. Um, for instance, the country has a rigidly stratified society with state assigned class system and political loyalty plays a central role in that society. This system determines where citizens may live, the type of accommodations and jobs that they may have, the quality of their education, including whether or not uh, whether or not they receive an education, how much food that they're rationed, whether they're allowed to travel internationally and domestically, and even who they can marry. The state also um, heavily controls and regulates, broadly speaking, its citizens' exposure to foreign information and foreigners. This penchant for control also extends to um, its economy. North Korea remains largely economically isolated and does not seriously engage in international trade. And in the past, they only engaged in trade with the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc, and more recently has largely traded only with China, um, although that particular relationship is probably best described as being an on, on and off type relationship. Originally, uh, private markets were banned in North Korea, um, but in the 1990s, the dissolution of the Soviet Union and a devastating famine called the um, arduous march and the resulting economic crisis revealed the inflexibility and the inability of their existing economic system to accommodate the sudden and drastic changes um, in the economy. And most critically, it revealed the inability of the public food um, distribution system to continue to successfully deliver rations to the populace. And as a result, the populace had to turn to black markets um, to survive. And these black markets, or rather um, all markets nowadays, are called changmadam. Around this time, the state also relaxed the collective uh, farming system and permitted the poor to privately own small plots of land and engage in um, subsistence uh, farming in rural areas. In the early days of the famine, the poor supported one another by forming mutual assistance and bartering networks. And eventually women began to produce clothes, shoes, and um, make more food, and um, began selling their surpluses to others in these uh, market settings. And over time, these networks grew into large black markets that took advantage of more and personal exchanges. And witnessing the success of these markets in providing its citizens with what they needed, the North Korean government was forced to first overlook, then permit the existence of private markets after the arduous march. Uh, the government, however, <clears throat> continues to heavily restrict the free operation of markets in North Korea today. Um, by implementing things such as identity-based um, vendor systems and age regulations. This re uh, rediscovery of the market helped North Koreans to weather the disaster and to even return to pre-disaster levels of consumption. And in fact, according to some reports and articles, through markets, 
North Koreans uh, are now able to purchase products that improve the quality of their lives, such as rice cookers, um, electric shavers, uh, dress shoes, uh, cosmetics, uh, DVD players, motorcycles, and uh, vinyl floor coverings. And even private medical services um, appeared in these markets with retired doctors offering their services. Um, it is believed that about um, half to three quarters of people's incomes um, come from various market activities in North Korea. And furthermore, as a direct consequence of the markets, non-elites were able to improve their lives. Some merchants whose uh, socioeconomic class historically restricted their access to education were now able to purchase um, private education for their children. Um, and, um, and really, um, really importantly, women's social status also rose as a consequence of their vital role in these private markets. As even this um, really brief comparison between the two Koreas hopefully conveys, um, through markets, South Koreans have um, access to more and better resources for physical and well uh, physical well being, and thereby have the means to achieve higher levels of social and psychological well being. And in fact, they have really good happy lives. In contrast, though, uh, North Korea remains one of the poorest and most oppressed countries in the world, um, and yet. In North Korea, where market activities were previously outlawed, it was the market that provided the means for the poor to survive during one of their worst famines. And today, uh, while North Koreans continue to live under a dictatorship and therefore lead incredibly challenging lives, um, even in those challenging circumstances, even when the market is still heavily restricted, it is the market that allows North Koreans to improve their lives and to live better lives. Um, so in short, um, a society that embraces markets tends to achieve higher standards of living and quality of life than a society that shuns them. And as we say in our book, people living in market societies are wealth, um, wealthier, healthier, happier, and better connected than those living in non-market societies. Moreover, um, we make a more controversial claim in the book. The economic and material, uh, material and social wealth that people in market societies enjoy um, is morally relevant. And so people living in market societies are more likely to be moral than those living in non-market societies. Um, and at, for instance, according to the statistics, South Korea outperforms North Korea on various um, measures of morality. This debate on the uh, morality of markets has a really long history, arguably extending as far back as Aristotle. And most scholars, even the critics of markets, accept that people are materially better off in um, market societies and that people are materially worse off in non-market societies. Um, however, there appears to be somewhat of a consensus among the critics, defenders, and students of commercial life that wealth um, that the wealth that societies gain by embracing markets come at a really high moral cost, in fact, too high, and that markets corrupt our morals. Um, this consensus um, contradicted what um, Virgil and I saw in our daily lives and what we thought the story of the two uh, Koreas, uh, the story of um, colonial Bahamas, pre and post communist Estonia and others told. Because if markets are truly morally corrupting and if markets really did crowd out virtue and corrupt the virtuous, the available empirical evidence should collectively show that. And we should expect to see the models and concepts in social sciences which best explain how markets function, explain how moral corruption is likely to occur. Um, however, the evidence collectively showed the exact opposite. Um, they suggested that markets are not the immoralizing spaces that many have imagined them to be. And instead that um, they showed that on average, people who live in market societies exhibit more virtue and less vice than those who live in non-market societies, suggesting that markets are in fact moralizing spaces. Specifically, we found that people in market societies tend to be more altruistic, are less likely to be materialistic and corrupt, 
and are more likely to be cosmopolitan as well as trusting and trustworthy. This might seem surprising and provocative um, to some, but it should not uh, should not seem too far-fetched for students and scholars of mainline local economy, of Austrian, Virginia, and Bloomington schools of local economy. Because the theoretical understanding of the market process as understood by Hayek, Kirzner, uh, Don Lavoie, and um, other Austrian economists points in the opposite direction of the central moral criticism of markets, that markets are morally corrupting. As we navigate markets as consumers, producers, clients, principals, uh, colleagues, competitors, um, not only do we discover prices and about each other's plans, needs, wants, and more, we also discover social information about the people, um, about people such as who is trustworthy and thus can be trusted. And it is our direct interactions with our colleagues, customers, competitors, suppliers, employers, bosses, and so many more that um, uh, the, our, it's our direct interactions that provide firsthand knowledge, which is sometimes tacit and inarticulate about their dis um, dispositions, their personalities, their moral uh, priorities, and so much more. We also have numerous opportunities in these settings to observe them interact with others and to acquire secondhand knowledge that sometimes confirms and sometimes opposes our ex existing impressions of them. This knowledge of what the other market actors are like informs our decisions regarding who to engage and avoid in future market um, transactions. Since people will want to do business with people who are virtuous and to avoid dealings with people who are immoral, markets will tend to reward virtuous behavior and punish immoral behavior. And in this manner, the market is a moral teacher, teaches us to be moral, to be more virtuous through the same old competitive and discovery process of the market that we understand as Austrian economists. And in a nutshell, that's what our book is about. Um, in closing though, I do wanna put a few things on the table about what our book does not do and what our argument does not imply. Uh, first, our argument about markets being uh, moralizing spaces and the market mechanism through which people learn to become more moral says nothing about noxious markets or those markets that elicit discomfort and revulsion, um, like the buying and selling of human beings. Second, our argument does not make an assessment about the importance of uh, democracy. Um, the empirical literature on democracy remains rather included inconclusive about democracy being an important source of economic, social, and moral development. And as the tale of the two Korea suggests, um, we think for a society to be successful, it is incredibly important that its political, economic, and social institutions mesh and jive well um, together. Finally, our argument doesn't imply um, that a society must adopt a particular culture or a particular set of cultural traits in order to benefit from the moral development by markets. Um, in fact, we conducted some additional analyses that we included in the appendix of our book um, that suggested that the reason why we observe more virtue and less vice in market societies than in non-market societies is not because of any cultural advantages that people in market societies happen to enjoy that people in non-market societies um, do not. Rather, our analysis showed that it is um, because of the moral advantages associated with markets. Um, thank you so much, and we hope you enjoy our book. So I very much enjoyed reading this book, um, and there is much to praise about it. Indeed, I found myself sort of aggressively nodding along as I read through it, um, but I'm going to focus on three aspects uh, that I especially thought were great about the book. And then I'm going to move to my main question, um, kind of a critique of the book, and of course bring some political theory to bear on the question of morality and markets. So first I want to praise the way the book is accessible to non-specialists and traverses disciplinary boundaries. So the trajectory of the argument, as uh, Ginny mentioned, follows the development of the discipline of economics first in moral philosophy and then in political economy and finally to economics as a science as it is practiced today. 
So in being faithful to the long conversation about markets and morality in the tradition of thinkers like Adam Smith or John Stuart Mill, the authors also make their analysis accessible to non-economists and actually non-academics more generally. Uh, for example, they provide a very clear definition of markets that goes beyond the confines of academic economics. So the authors state, quote, a market is a space where the buying and selling of goods and services takes place. In market, sellers compete with one another to attract buyers, and buyers compete with one another to secure goods and services that they desire. In markets, people also cooperate with one another to produce and purchase goods and services, end quote. So I think their work does much to bridge the divide between politics, philosophy, and economics uh, that exists in both common parlance and academic scholarship. And their discussion of uh, economic analyses are also very clear and understandable to the non-economist. I mean, in these aspects of the work, they also show their breadth and depth as scholars, discussing sources from medieval Europe to contemporary philosophy, to psychology, and of course, to economics. Second, uh, the focus on culture, namely the stories we tell ourselves, is an innovative way to engage this debate about markets and morality. Store and Choi confront the reader both with cultural stories that treat markets as immoral, and similarly provide evidence of alternative fables that illustrate the converse. Store and Choi are successful in thinking through the stories we tell about markets and actually course correcting these stories to show that markets bring about moral outcomes. Their attention to the moral stories we tell about markets helps address this gap between everyday experience and academic scholarship. And they also include contemporary interactions with marketplaces uh, like eBay or Uber or Amazon, et cetera, that make the argument realistic to the non-specialized reader, but also engage the everyday discussions we have about markets, even when we realize, um, might not realize that we are doing so. And so I think this work does much to reorient our cultural imagination, uh, though I do wonder if certain aspects are missing from, from the storytelling, and I'm going to come back to that. Third and finally, uh, as, as Jenny mentioned, they go beyond the minimalist defense of markets. So usually when asked if markets are corrupting, defenders of markets dismiss these arguments claiming that, well, if markets are corrupting, it doesn't matter because they bring about wealth, uh, that markets rely on selfishness to achieve all the good that they do, but who cares because they do so much good, or that markets are not the only corrupting force in society, so why should they receive special attention? And finally, that uh, markets are just simply amoral. The problem, as the authors put it, is that, quote, ironically, many of the strongest defenders of markets proceed as if they believe, perhaps deep down, that the moral critics of markets are correct. Instead of meeting them head on, there's a tendency to try to sidestep or minimize the moral criticisms of markets, end quote. So they do not argue like others that markets are merely a tool or a mirror that reflects what we already are back at us. Instead, Store and Choi argue that markets actually make people more moral. So in their work, the authors confront the question directly, finding through both normative and empirical analysis that first, markets improve people's lives, which is morally significant, um, and second, that the market requires virtuous behavior and also encourages this behavior by rewarding it, and third, that markets are morally edifying. And so now I wanna transition to a question or critique I have of the book. So those store and Choi identify many views of markets as monsters, that markets are exploitative, morally corrupting, all-consuming, and generate inequality. I think there's a missing monster or a key actor in this story that is largely silent, and that's government or the state. So in the conclusion, and, and Jenny mentioned this, um, the authors assert that they are silent on the role of democracy <clears throat> and consequently the, the political more generally. However, isn't that where much of the confusion about markets and their potential morality comes about? It seems that many critics of markets misplace blame for the immorality they find in society on markets rather than focusing this blame on the way in which immorality results from corporate elites and political elites working together and utilizing their power and influence in socially harmful ways. And so I'm gonna focus on two ways that this problematic relationship fosters corruption, uh, talking about inequality and crony capitalism, and then maybe one way to potentially combat these forms of corruption and that's civic participation. So first on the concern of inequality, many would argue that the issue is not whether markets make us better, 
but instead that markets continue to create elites in a liberal democratic society that ought to uh, privilege equality. That is to say, many are focused not on whether the tools of the market um, improve our lives on the minimalist defense of increases in standard of living or health or education, et cetera, things which are really not so minimal, um, or that markets make us better people. They only care if markets make us more unequal. Now, I think this question is misplaced, but it is one of the most common arguments against the value and use of markets, at least since Rousseau and Marx, whom the authors um, engage early on in the book. Rousseau, as the authors rightly explain, focused on how the division of labor makes us dependent on one another and that we try to get what we want at the expense of others. For Marx, as the authors describe, the market system run by the capitalists um, exploit and alienates the worker. So Storr and Choi address the criticism about markets generating inequality in chapter four, um, the chapter on people improve their lives through markets. And they point out two criticisms of Thomas Piketty's thesis that inequality is an inevitable consequence of markets or that the rate of return on capital will always be higher than economic growth in the long run. They do address Piketty's argument and conclude first that, quote, markets do not seem to exaggerate economic inequality, end quote. They note studies demonstrating that inequality was about the same in pre-industrial societies and even today, inequality appears higher in non-market societies. Second, Storr and Choi also note that wealth is not stable for millionaires or billionaires in a market society, nor for top firms. They note a number of examples of wealth turnover. As they put it, quote, the rich simply cannot be confident they will be able to maintain their wealth in market societies, end quote. So due to a number of factors, uh, some of which Piketty himself notes, such as inheritance, uh, taxation, consumption, and competition, it is unlikely that there will be a fixed wealthy class. Dor and Troy briefly, however, mention one factor that contributes to the complaints about inequality, and that's social immobility for the poorest in society. And here that, that mostly silent actor government appears. They state, quote, current relative social immobility often arises from non-market barriers to social mobility, not from the existence of markets. For example, minimum wage laws and other labor market regulations raise the cost of hiring and firing employees thereby making it difficult for new workers to find employment. Stringent business regulations make it difficult for people to start businesses, end quote. So here they note the role of non-market factors, in other words, government, as one of the real monsters people are upset about when they criticize the market's effect on inequality. But these non-market factors do not receive sustained attention in their argument. So the author's argument for competition, ousting elites from their privileged positions, um, brings me to my second point about the missing political monster from the argument. So are elites really subject to competition if they are using their overwhelming wealth to pay politicians and government actors to keep their positions? That is to say, one of the potentially very worrisome critiques about the morality of markets is their negative potential when the tools of the market um, are abused by the state. I think the political economic and political philosophic question of the potentially problematic moral consequences of the tools of markets in the wrong hands is important to confront. In other words, one of the potential corruptors of our morals is crony capitalism. So what are the ways that rent seeking or regulatory capture, for instance, corrupt our morals or at the very least corrupt our thinking about the potential of markets? Now it should be noted that the authors briefly address rent seeking in chapter five but I want to expand on how crony capitalism can affect moral outcomes of market interactions. And I think this is especially concerning because as the father of economics, Adam Smith notes, quote, this disposition to admire and almost to worship the rich and powerful and to despise, or at least to neglect persons of poor and mean condition, though necessary both to establish and to maintain the distinction of rakes and the order of society, is at the same time the great and most universal cause of the corruption of our moral sentiments, end quote. And that's from his theory of moral sentiments. So for Smith, we tend to ignore the moral failings of the richest in society because we want to be like them, or at least we seek the order we think their lives uh, must have because of all of the conveniences uh, that they possess. In the case of crony capitalism, we not only elevate the rich in our moral imaginations, but we ignore or don't see the ways in which they buy undue influence in our political system. 
And for Smith, this has great potential to undermine um, our, the moral outcomes of our society. Indeed, Smith highlights many ways he sees crony capitalism at work. In his lectures on jurisprudence, Smith says, quote, the very end of government is to secure wealth and to defend the rich from the poor, end quote. Here, Smith actually makes a similar claim to that of Rousseau in his discourse on inequality um, that the authors do not focus on, that government is established for the benefit of the rich. Smith does see a role for government, but worries about governments awarding monopolies to companies against their countrymen and the ways that masters of capital collude with one another and the legislature against their workers to lower wages. Smith also offers examples of the way that non-market actors can limit the access of the least advantaged to the economic and moral benefits of the market. So for example, in his refutation of the Settlement Act of the English Poor Law, Smith condemns the arbitrary oversight of parish overseers who uh, prevented laborers from following the market for labor, an economic consequence. But he also emphasizes the negative effect this arbitrary oversight has on the moral development of workers. In Smith's telling, their character is called into question and they are likely to be ignored or scorned by their fellows simply for seeking employment in a parish that is not their home parish. So the collusion of political and economic elites has a detrimental effect on moral progress. And finally, again, related to uh, the skewing of the political. So though the authors engage with normative critiques of markets, there is a normative analysis missing. And I think that's the role of civic participation. So it seems that if markets are spaces where interaction with others is morally educative, then local participation politically might be similarly edifying. They briefly mention civic participation as part of a discussion on the role of democracy and development and do not rule out its potential, but are largely silent on the issue. As thinkers from Tocqueville to Coase to Eleanor Ostrom realized, local coordination can be a powerful way to utilize or supplement the tools of the market and a way to uh, combat elite or government control over society's resources. In Democracy in America, Alexis de Tocqueville puts it like this, quote, every rich and powerful citizen is in practice the head of a permanent and enforced association composed of all those whom he makes help in the execution of his designs. But among democratic peoples, all the citizens are independent and weak. They can hardly do anything for themselves and none of them is in a position to force his fellows to help him. They would all therefore find themselves helpless if they did not learn to help each other voluntarily." End quote. So in other words, for Tocqueville, only the force of ordinary citizens organizing locally can combat the powerful and privileged in carrying out their schemes. So the answer to the missing political might be that the political is not useful at all to the case that markets do not corrupt our morals, but actually make us more moral. After all, the book is not called Do Politics Corrupt Our Morals? But if this is the case, I think the author should state the claim. And I actually don't think that the problematic role of the political would distract from the important story that markets work in ways that we don't normally conceive, or that the claim about crony capitalism undermines the important countercultural story that markets are conversations and are morally edifying. I actually think incorporating the political as another potential monster that corrupts our morals when it utilizes the tools of the market, supplements and extends the argument store and choice make in the book. So the study of markets, economics, is indeed best understood as the authors state early on in the book as quote, the science of how societies allocate scarce resources efficiently, the science of consumption and production, the science of exchange, is thus rooted in the study of right and wrong, the study of justice, and the study of how we might live better together, end quote, then market concerns have always been tied to the political. Additionally, the authors suggest that markets need politics. They say, quote, well-functioning markets thus depend on clear and respected property rights, reliable contract enforcement, and mechanisms for resolving disputes, end quote. So as the authors admit, markets and politics often cannot be so neatly separated. Um, and in fact, they acknowledge the interconnectedness of political and economic systems, but note, um, as Jenny mentioned in her uh, case study of the two Koreas, that market societies can take place in a variety of political uh, settings. So they limit the scope of their analysis, stating, quote, as long as the political systems in these countries secure property rights, enforce contracts, and safeguard the rule of law, we will describe them as market societies, end quote. Perhaps, but the missing actor that corrupts our morals seems not to be the market, but the state and the collusion between political economic elites. 
And it seems that this collusion could undermine the strong case made by the authors for the moral potential of markets or the way in which um, markets can make us more moral and how far that extends. Thank you. So I'd actually like to um, give my comments, which are, are, are a little bit similar to what Bree has stated uh, in that I think one of the things that is missing in this book is that tackling this idea that substituting the political process for the market process can actually corrupt our morals. Um, so I do think that the goal of the book to defend the moral character of markets is an important one. And especially given the current political and social climate where market competition and the accumulation of wealth tends to be villainized, right, this is a very important book for a lot of people to read, not just economists, not just scholars, but everybody. Um, so I think that successfully through, through going through the theoretical and empirical evidence, um, the authors do an excellent job giving us evidence that markets don't make us worse people. And in many cases, they do improve our moral characters. But in the last paragraph, I think the authors raise what, in my opinion, is probably one of the most important questions they ask in the book. And I think that to successfully defend the moral character of markets, uh, this, is a this is a question that needs to be addressed. So in the last paragraph, the author state, if our argument that markets can be a source of moral development is correct, there are also potentially moral costs associated with restricting markets. If markets are really spaces where we discover whether the people we are interacting with are good or bad people, limiting our access to markets or hampering markets might actually limit our ability to discover virtuous others. If markets are really conversations about right and wrong, then moves to truncate that conversation might limit our ability to learn to be virtuous. So a big part of me wishes that the book and the powerful arguments that it makes didn't end there, but kept going to take on this idea that substituting the political process for the market process will create incentives that will reward vice instead of virtue. Um, so I think that there are basically four different ways based on the arguments that the authors have made in the book there are four different ways in which impediments to the market process can likely corrupt our moral character um, and i'll take each one in turn so the first is that impediments to markets deny people the benefits that markets provide and that in and of itself is an immoral outcome um, so this kind of speaks to smith's view of beneficence uh, not just the idea that good intentions matter but whether or not we actually achieve a good outcome matters as well. Um, so as the proverb, proverb states, hell is full of good meetings, but heaven is full of good works, right? The morality of our actions should not be determined by motivation alone. And if we're trying to judge the morality of a system, the consequences need to be considered. So a system in which actors intend to commit good, but instead cause widespread harm, cannot and should not be touted as a moral system. And so if it is true, as the overwhelming empirical evidence that is presented suggests that market oriented institutions uh, lead to human flourishing and markets seem to provide a set of rules that allow people to pursue their own version of a good life without interfering in the ability of others to pursue theirs. Uh, people living in market-based societies tend to be more tolerant, less materialistic, wealthier, more satisfied with their lives than people living in societies that restrict economic freedom. So erecting barriers that prevent markets from functioning, even if they are well-intended, they produce the immoral outcome of eliminating exchange opportunities through which many people could have improved their lives. Um, so if we're confronted with overwhelming evidence that market-based uh, societies achieve greater uh, human flourishing than trying to stifle the market process comes with the consequence of knowing that we could also be stifling people's ability to flourish. Um, and it's not just material well-being. Both Hayek and Friedman have argued that economic freedom is a prerequisite for other human rights and civil liberties. And this hypothesis has been supported empirically 
with regards to political freedom as well as freedom of the press. Um, in addition, my own work on examining the relationship between economic freedom and women's well being and women's rights finds that countries that are more economically free have greater gender equality, that restrictions on women's rights are much more severe in non market societies. Um, so restricting access to markets don't doesn't just restrict our ability to flourish in material ways, but it also restricts uh, social progress towards other moral ends, such as political and, and civil liberties. The second way I think that inhibiting the market process can lead to a corruption of our character is that it creates a system of incentives that rewards immoral behavior. So this is Institutions that are market oriented or otherwise, they dictate the relative costs and benefits of the possible actions that we can take at any given time. So certain rules may reward moral behavior, such as cooperation, tolerance, honesty, and prudence, while other rules may pro provide higher rewards to immoral and non-cooperative behaviors, such as violence, theft, and dishonesty. Um, in Smith's theory of moral sentiments, he discusses the impartial spectator, which is a internal dialogue and sort of ethical invisible hand that guides our behavior. We're not born with a fully developed moral compass and we're not given an objective list of moral rules to follow. The only guidance we begin with is a natural ability to empathize with other humans and all virtuous behavior is derived from that empathy combined with the desire to be praised and judged by, uh, be judged by others as praiseworthy. Throughout our lives, we observe the actions of those around us and take note of how others react. And through observation and experience, we learn which behaviors are acceptable and praiseworthy, as well as which behaviors are socially unacceptable and ought to be avoided. So this means our impartial spectator, our moral character is influenced by the social context within which it develops. If virtue can be learned, so can vice. From a moral standpoint, it's important to understand whether the incentives people face encourage them to practice vice or to practice virtue. As the authors of this book have made the argument in support of the fact that market institutions that are based on voluntary, mutually beneficial exchanges, they generate moral views that differ from those generated in institutional settings where coercion dominates. If coercive political exchange relationships reward behaviors that are less virtuous than the behaviors rewarded by market exchange, then the more the political process is substituted for the market process, the more corrupt man is likely to become. Public choice economist uh, Gordon Tullock in his analysis of bureaucracy had the following to say, it is impossible to design a system that will select against the man of relatively low morals. This is because the intelligent but unscrupulous man will always assume the morally proper course of action, if in fact, this should be the one that is most likely to be successful. If in terms of advancing his own personal interests, the best course of action lies with the morally acceptable set, the immoral man will not choose differently from a moral man. It is only if the best course of action should be barred by the standards of prevailing morality that the differences in moral, moral orientation come to play. And here it is evident that the man who is willing to transgress possesses an advantage. Um, and so both Tulloch in his analysis of bureaucracy and Hayek in The Road to Serfdom talk about how the political process will select for rewarding those who are um, ambitious and unscrupulous. It is easier to get ahead in a zero sum game by appealing to the favor of those in power through rent seeking and sycophancy. So the system itself encourages immoral behavior. And there are some other ways in which impediments to the market process reward immoral behavior that are a bit more subtle. Uh, for example, amidst humanitarian crisis and natural, such as natural disasters or the current global pandemic, price ceilings are often implemented in the name of protecting the public from opportunists who want to exploit tragedy for personal gain. However, the rising prices discipline the urge that co consumers may have to purchase more than what they truly need during uncertain times. And they encourage producers to adapt their production processes to increase supply during a time when they are likely facing higher costs and greater risk. These prices, while see, these price increases, while they seem like an immoral outcome, they help us avoid widespread shortages. 
People who hoard crucial supplies or purchase the entire stock that an item in a store, uh, entire, entire stock of an item in a store only to resell it um, are often painted at the poster children for unfettered greed and unleashed markets. However, these people are simply pursuing a profit opportunity that only exists due to a price ceiling, an impediment in the price mechanism imposed by the political system. Restricting freedom to trade also generates perverse moral incentives. And so I know that the authors didn't really touch on noxious markets, but prohibiting the sales of drugs, alcohol, and sex renders the formal channels of property rights protection and contract enforcement inaccessible to suppliers of these goods. And that leads them vulnerable to theft and violence and other forms of predation. So to succeed in those markets, then requires investing in violence yourself and building a reputation that strongly discourages others from stealing your property. Immigration restrictions, shelter and place orders and other limitations on the ability for individuals to travel freely encourages friends and neighbors to report on one another for breaking rules in the name of public safety. And this undermines the bonds of social trust that makes it much more difficult to sustain social cooperation. Even a burdensome regulatory environment is considered a necessary ingredient for producing corruption. So if the rules impose substantial costs on pursuing profit opportunities through voluntary and moral means, more people will then pursue profit opportunities that exist through the immoral ones. The third way I think that inhibiting the market process would lead to a corruption of our moral character is that it prevents individuals from taking responsibility for their own moral development. So one of the stronger arguments I think that is made in this book and in, in many others is that um, people who are engaging in market transactions, they're rewarded when they are behaving in a moral way. So if they're being honest, if they're keeping their word, these are the types of behaviors that market re markets reward. Um, so, when we start to infringe on people's market choices through you know, behavioral policy interventions like the nudges that were made popular by Sunstein and Thaler, uh, we take certain, we raise the cost of certain choices. So the individual who cuts back on their consumption of sugary beverages because they live in a region where now selling sugary beverages is banned, that person hasn't made a choice at all, let alone one that improves their character. Proponents of nudges argue that the approach of nudges is non-coercive because we're not entirely limiting the choice from the set of possibilities, just raising the cost. However, things like sin taxes, excise, the excise taxes associated with consumption of vice, they are presented in a way to discourage people from engaging in that behavior. Um, so behaviors that are harmful to their health, to their financial situation, or even the environment. So by raising the cost of sinning, the paternalist believes that these interventions will encourage virtuous behavior, while the immoral option is still technically available in both the case, case of nudges and sin taxes. The fact remains that the ones who determined the morality of the options were the choice architects themselves and not those making the choice, not the choosers. Even if a policymaker is correct in their moral determination, they have interfered with the chooser's ability to come to that conclusion on their own. As Jim Buchanan had said, man wants liberty to become the man he wants to become. We give our lives meaning through the choices that we make. This includes the choices we make regarding our moral character. Can an individual who is insulating from, insulated from making moral choices truly learn how to be virtuous on their own? Limiting someone's freedom to choose their own moral path robs them of this learning process. And finally, I think inhibiting the market process also inhibits our ability to discover rules that are morally superior to what currently exists. Um, restricting the market process in the name of morality presumes that those who design the restrictions possess knowledge of objective moral truth. And while in theory, there might be a comprehensive and objective set of moral truths, this type of knowledge is not readily available to humans. And actions that were once socially acceptable, like telling a sexist joke, are now viewed as vulgar and offensive. 
actions that were once considered to be mortal sins like suicide are now instead recognized as desperate acts committed by the mentally troubled. Many states in the United States had laws that prevented interracial marriages and same-sex relationships that the majority of citizens themselves once supported. Even the most egregious atrocities like slavery and genocide are somehow morally justified by those who enforce and benefit from the rules that allow these things to occur. So the set of actions that society deems morally permissible undoubtedly changes over time and it differs across societies at any given point in time. So when we're interacting in a market, we must discover for ourselves through those trial and error interactions, which actions are deemed praiseworthy by other members of society and which ones are considered disreputable. It is not only the goods and services that we are exchanging through markets, but we're trading aspects of our culture, including notions of what is morally acceptable behavior. In order for markets to have a civilizing effect, they need to be open so that people will come into contact with cultures that are more virtuous than their own. One of the arguments that Becker makes in his work on discrimination, uh, it, may, it notes that markets alone are not guaranteed to reduce discriminatory behavior if consumers themselves hold the same discriminatory preferences as employers. If consumers prefer to discriminate, then the cost savings a firm receives from hiring members of a marginalized group who they can hire at a lower wage, they will be outweighed by a decrease in sales that their former customers will then take their business elsewhere. But the loss in sales is only guaranteed if businesses are not selling to consumers outside of their own society i.e. if markets are closed. So if they are exchanging with people from other societies, they're more likely to have customers that do not prefer discrimination. And so that competitive market process will still encourage greater tolerance over time. At the same time, people have to have the freedom to challenge the status quo. If they think the dominant view of what is acceptable and unacceptable is morally wrong or unjust. To discover moral truths, there must be an open and competitive dialogue about which actions are moral and which are immoral, and that cannot exist when certain actions that are deemed immoral at a moment of time are not permissible by law. Limits to economic freedom prevent people from challenging the social order in many ways. Gender-based labor restrictions, for example, prevent pioneering women from entering into professions that are only considered appropriate for men because they're simply not allowed to do it. It's not that they don't want to, it's not that they won't be successful, but they're not permitted to take that chance. Restrictions on the ability for people to enter into voluntary marriage contract with the person or persons of their choice prevents people from challenging social perceptions of which types of relationships, which type of loving relationships are maybe morally superior to others. So limiting the market process limits our ability to discover the potential new improvements to our existing view of morality. So while I think that the authors go a long way to defend that markets do not corrupt our morals and that markets help us become more moral, virtuous people, a stronger argument could be made by going further and saying that impediments to those market process by substituting the market process for the political process we're creating a system of incentives that promotes vice. Um, so I wanna start by emphasizing that this is a fantastic book and I think it's fantastic for a wide variety of audiences. I've personally learned a lot from it. I think a lot of scholars in philosophy, politics, economics, and related disciplines would. And I've used it in a seminar on moral philosophy paired with, I used it at the end after covering traditional consequentialism, deontology, virtue ethics, and then the students read this book. And that was a course with philosophy graduate students and an advanced undergraduates from different disciplines. And I think they all, they would emphasize different parts of the book, but I think they were able to really engage with all of it. So I would highly encourage people in different disciplines to use this text in their teaching and to learn from it for their scholarship. For this discussion today, what I want to consider is mostly how the book and its argument fits into a broader landscape of arguments and views about the morality of markets. 
I'll emphasize that the book is very much comparative, fairly obviously so, that even came out in Ginny's introduction, that there's a consideration of how different societies compare to each other. This is different than the way that some, maybe particularly philosophers, will often approach things of just trying to like consider the badness in the one society on its own. I think these authors um, properly make the questions all comparative. That is, if the claim is that markets corrupt, it's okay compared to what? What's the society that doesn't have the corruption? If it's really the markets that are doing the problem, we should be able to see some sort of difference. There's a set of arguments that even are comparative, but that I think the book mentions, discusses, but doesn't, at least in any head-on way, address. And those are ones that take the market activity itself not to cause corruption, but to constitute corruption. It's people who think things like that exchanges themselves are like an inappropriate way of engaging with people instead of say gift giving or something like that. If you took the market activity itself to be the corrupt measure, you'd probably end up with some very different data sets. I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if it turns out that market societies had more market behavior. And so if that was the measure of ice, it would look rather corrupting. Um, now, I'm not personally inclined to think those arguments that market behaviors themselves are corrupt. I don't find those arguments compelling, but there definitely is a literature um, that makes that kind of case. And I think this book just ha doesn't deal with those perfectly fine. It's considering whether markets cause some sort of corruption external to it. That, of course, is a very common view, and I want to divide between sort of two versions of it. Um, what I take to be the main target are those that make the criticism in a marginal way. Uh, these are critics who say that markets corrupt and more markets corrupt even more. Um, something like the slogan of more markets, more problems. And there are definitely people who hold this, um, Rousseau and his proposals for Corsica sort of suggested, ah, you're gonna have some trade, but you wanna keep it from being too much. You wanna restrict international trade. So, because adding that extra trade would start to undermine citizens' virtues. Uh, Eric Olinwright in his How to Be an Anti-Capitalist says, greed and fear are motivations fostered by the nature of competitive markets and that the more intense the competition and the higher the stakes, the more greed and fear are reinforced as individualized operating motivations, which contribute to the corrosive elements of capitalism. So there's this claim, not just that markets kind of corrupt, but more markets, more problems. And I think that this is an extremely important kind of argument to address because even many of the critics of markets who accept, which Storr and Choi argue for, that markets are highly productive of wealth, there are a number of critics that accept that, but then say, but we should still make trade-offs on the margin. We might be willing to accept a bit less of that efficiency, a bit less wealth production to try and have a bit less greed or the like. As it happens, Eric Olinwright, again, in his How to Be an Anti-Capitalist says, while it is true that income is unequally distributed in capitalist economies, it is also true that the array of consumption goods available and affordable for the average person, and even for the poor, has increased dramatically almost everywhere. So he accepts that markets are highly productive of wealth, but thinks that they come at a cost on the margin, and that might favor certain kinds of restrictions on how extensive the market is. I think a number of critics are in that kind of boat. So this is where Storr and Choi's analysis is very useful. They suggest rightly that if markets are causing corruption, then what we should see is more corruption in the more market-based societies. The analysis then is to look across countries, uh, divide them between the more and less market uh, driven, and then check their morals across various measures. 
the way that they end up dividing using a number of indices of how market-based or how much protection of private property, enforcement of contracts, rule of law, or a measure thereof, you end up with a set of countries that are the market-based ones because they're high on all of those indices. I think people will generally not dispute the ones that they count as market-based. It gives you an interesting diverse set. It, for instance, includes countries that are more or less extensive in their welfare states, have different healthcare policies, have various degrees of punitiveness in their punishment systems or use different punishments altogether. So you get the market societies, including things ranging roughly Singapore to Sweden. Then there's a variety of metrics that are used, as Jenny discussed. They include things like measures of trust, trustworthiness uh, with trust, especially trust of strangers, toleration of differences of all sorts, charitable giving. And what they find compellingly is that market societies as a whole do better on all of these or at least do as well on some of uh, them such as trust of people who are close to you appears to be not particularly affected but cross measures market societies do at least as well and almost always better than non-market societies one of the things with these arguments about the margins that I would expect the critics to do then is suggest that while Storr and Choi provide a plausible way of doing this divide, there might be other ways of cutting the data. And I think this is nice. This is not a, a criticism of Storr and Choi, but a suggestion for where ongoing research can go that for a number of people who either want to show the robustness of this finding or try and undermine it, there'll be a variety of ways to go forward in the literature. Maybe check other years, check more trends over time, population adjusted averages instead of just counting each country as one, um, excluding marginal cases of various sorts. So there are at least some countries that are counted as markets that were only on one index where most of them were on more than one. Might want to exclude some of those. Um, having more gradation of how much there are markets. Store and Choi, very plausible first cut, have the market-based and the non-market-based, but one could have degrees thereof. Um, and other measures of morality that people might favor. All of these are things that people going forward in this literature could attempt to address. That's one of the incredible contributions that the book gives is that it provides a framework for people to investigate these questions, to say, all right, if people really think that markets corrupt, what's the measure of corruption? And what's the measure of marketness? And how do the numbers actually go? One final sort of argument I want to highlight that is Oh, not particularly addressed by the book, but that I think some of the main critics of markets have is what I call a utopian criticism. These are people who will agree that we want to be doing a comparative analysis, but will deny that the data that Storr and Choi look at is the relevant data. And this is because they, when making their comparison, aren't thinking that it's markets corrupt relative to all existing non-market societies, but some society that perhaps we don't actually have data on. Uh, earlier, I mentioned that Rousseau does make marginal claims, but more fundamentally, and what Storr and Choi point to, his claim is to comparisons of pre-social solitary conditions. There's a claim that what Rousseau calls a savage, would not have certain kinds of vices that we see in modern market societies. So that's not a claim. We don't, I checked the index of countries and solitary individuals wandering in the forest didn't have data. So there'd be that kind of push that 
if it's something that's not actually counted, it wouldn't be seen in the data either way. Same, the uh, Marxists, I think, would tend to make a claim of this sort, that they would deny that the countries that are classified as non-market represent the society that they are concerned to promote in contrast to markets. And they don't, when they claim that markets corrupt, they don't need to be claiming that they corrupt relative to past or existing societies. I think the Marxists would be particularly prone to make this sort of argument because of what Marx says about the efficiency of market societies. Marx is clear in the Capitalist Manifesto and elsewhere that capitalism is more efficient and more productive than every social system that ever existed before it. Yet then he also claims that it's inefficient and will have the chaos of the market, etc. Any claims that there's a fetters on production in capitalism is not a claim relative to all the previously existing societies, but against some ideal that hasn't yet existed. The claim is that there's some as yet not existent society that would be even more efficient. In parallel, the Marxists might claim the same with corruption. They might say, yes, markets have uh, made people more moral than the non-market societies by bringing them in contact with more people or um, bringing their interests in various ways linked, but there'd be some as yet non-existent society that would be even more moral. The problem that this critic faces is that though Storr and Choi don't directly take on the argument. The data that they have doesn't include um, proletarian utopia or the like. What it does do is puts a very heavy burden on the person making that claim. What it says is right now our evidence is of all the societies that we have data on that the ones with markets and, had, and more extensive markets are the ones that have the most moral behavior. If the data had gone the other way, the Marxist would have an interesting case because then they could say we can be even more moral if we combined a little of this and a little of that. But it looks like the little of this and little of that would be markets. And so they have to now explain how it is that markets have advanced morality compared to all the things that existed, yet something that we have no data on would do even better. Not impossible to do that. They might be able to come up with mechanisms, small scale experiments, or other forms of evidence or argument to that effect. But it's a heavy burden of proof on them now it, that there wouldn't be if the data came out differently. So I think that's another way that the book sort of throws down a gauntlet for people who want to make that sort of claim, even though not directly answering the arguments that the utopians would make. I, um, I wanted to say something about the book, um, <clears throat> which I think you all will resonate with all of you, which is that to me, one of the most important arguments in intellectual history, uh, so in this, I'm looking at Voltaire, Montesquieu, uh, Tocqueville Smith himself, Hume, uh, you know, this kind of arguments, um, they were all talking about the correlation between opening up markets or commercial society and the do commerce thesis. That what made commercial society better than the previous ways of organizing affairs, say tradition or whatever, was in fact that it was civilizing. That it wasn't primarily about the ruthless efficiency of the system, you know, drive price down the cost and make sure that you're producing uh, uh, using the least cost technologies and all of that stuff. It's not that that argument per se is off the table. It's that it's not the primary argument, uh, right? And, and so I see, you know, uh, Storr and Choi, along with McCloskey, as representing putting that argument back at the center from within the discipline of economics. Um, <clears throat> and so, it's this idea of, of civilizing aspects of trade, turning strangers into friends, smoothing our rough edges, you know, smoothing our rough edges uh, out. And this idea that, that Jenny raised at the end about markets as moral teachers. And, I, and, and so I think that in many ways, Bree and, uh, you know, Rosie raised that 
discussion very much. And Chad challenges it, I think, with a very uh, sort of interesting idea about that market behavior itself is what's corrupting. And that claim is actually a really in, uh, intriguing claim to address, you know, right? I mean, it's, it's something that I think at one level is like, I would say as an economist using the technical term nuts, <laughs> but at another level, as a citizen, as someone who you know grew up in families and has moral intuitions that people have in intimate settings, that it's perfectly the way everyone thinks at some level too. And so I think that all of this stuff is really uh, pretty fascinating. The other thing that I was going to make is Bree came up with this term, and I love it. And I love it as a challenge to, uh, to uh, Virgil and to Ginny, which is that there's the mostly science monster of the state or government involved in this. And, and Rosie gave very good uh, examples, basically, of how you get the counterintuitive remarks. And especially in this time and in this period where the moral higher ground has shifted again to people who believe that concerted state action is the only way that you can address social ills. Uh, you know, I, I think of us in many ways, not us, in classical liberals, as we're like a kind of a beverage moment again. So if you ever go back and look at the cartoon characters trying to communicate what the beverage plan was about, it has this little tiny, you know, uh, uh, man that says government. And then he's facing the five giants. That's what they call it, right? The five giants of, you know, want, disease, ignorance, squalor, and idleness. And, and you know, government, this little guy has this sword and he's taking on, you know, the, the five giants. And unless we empower, you know, that, that little, little government to be big government, the giants are going to win, you know? And so... You know, this is, I think that we're kind of at that kind of moment again, which means the cycle of intellect or the pendulum of intellectual uh, debate. And so I think it's fascinating to, to weigh and, 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 and think about these kind of questions about why, what is the argument that we're actually making about markets? Like what makes markets interesting for us to even think about? And I'm very grateful for for all of the comments and the, and the book. But anyway, I look, it's uh, been fantastic conversation. Um, I hope again, you know, Ginny, congratulations uh, on such a fantastic book that you and Virgil have produced. And thank you very much to, to Bree and Rosie and Chad for giving us so much to think about. So thank you very much. And I, finally, I just wanna thank again uh, you know, Matt and, and uh, you know, Carla and uh, Stephanie and the whole ASP team for everything that they do for us and continuing to go forward, including yourself, Ginny. And uh, so this is a great, a great uh, way to end the spring 2021 semester. And hopefully in fall 2021, we'll have lots more of these things and in person. Uh, so we can interact with each other the way intellectual life is meant to be. So thank you. Thank you for listening to the Hayek Program podcast. To learn more about the research, scholars, and work of the Hayek Program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. For more information about graduate student fellowship opportunities for students at Mason as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. We hope you recommend students to our programs or consider applying yourself.